Mindfulness is a bit of a journey because mm-hmm. you have to you have to kind of get rid of all the hustle and bustle before you, you get in the right headspace. And yep. that's exactly like running out in the forest. I say to people, you need to probably be out there for an hour because I reckon it takes you 20 minutes to get rid of all the shit from yep. normal life. And then you've got 20 minutes of where it's paradise. And then you've probably got 20 minutes where you're sort of re-entering society again. Alrighty, guys. Oh, that's Bill's intro. I don't do it like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, guys, welcome back to Adventure Radio. You are sitting here with Tom Ahern and Dan Katz. Katzy. Yeah, you? I'm filling in for Billy Boy yeah. while he's off uh, wandering around Vietnam. Burning chicks in Vietnam? <laughs> he's probably not. Oh, he's, there. He's, 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 he's dealing drugs. That's he's probably dealing there. drugs in Vietnam. Yeah. Dealing drugs. Heroin. Yeah, heroin. Yeah. <laughs> All the good stuff. It's one of his trips, yeah. He's, uh, opiates a big thing over there, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. A lot of money. Very yeah. profitable. Fuck, it makes me want to go over there. Mate, you gotta you got to get adventure for, you know, off the ground somehow. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> You've got to be relaxed about it. It's stressful to uh, build a company up. Yeah, it is, it is. Let off um, some steam. Yeah. Now, so today, guys, we have a very interesting guest for you, actually, the one and only Steve Monaghetti. Now, Steve Monaghetti is a an internationally recognized uh, marathon runner. He's been to four Olympic Games, I believe. Um, he's, he came... Did he win the Commonwealth, from memory? Yes. Yes, yeah. And... Uh, He's a skinny as a rake, the poor bastard. <laughs> well, he is a marathon he's runner. A marathon runner. <laughs> yeah, no, we we love him. He's an absolute legend. But um, for your information, guys, for some fucking reason, we lost the first eight minutes of the show. So what Dan and I thought we'd do is uh, we'll, we'll cut it so we get the first um, question rocking, and then the actual the last you know fifths fifth sixths of the show were actually um, way more interesting. The first, but. Uh, we thought we'd uh, do the the Tommy's tribute with Steve, yeah. obviously. Oh, it's, it's a tribute to Steve. <laughs> it's a tribute to. It's an homage. It's an homage. <laughs> it's an homage. It's a homage to Steve. And um, and then we'll we'll talk some shit a little bit, and then we'll uh, introduce um, Steve by way of cutting to Steve. Yeah. So, guys, uh, what I have done for today is actually I decided to do Green Day. I did wake me up when September ends, and. Um, uh, look, I reckon it was probably a good thing that we missed that one. It didn't go down too well. <laughs> it was. It was just very. Uh, it was. It was a little awkward. I it was felt a awkward. all being serenaded a little <laughs> yeah. bit. But yeah. fuck it, let's do it. Awkward's good. Yeah, awkward's great. I mean, look, you know, when I was doing the show, I was full bar, but I was very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I was just very nervous, but but excited clearly at the time. <laughs> all right. So without further ado, I will just sing to Dan and myself. Wake me up when Steve stops running. <laughs> Is that out? That yeah. <laughs> sounds very out. So we'll keep going anyway. All right. <clears throat> Summer has come and passed, but Steve still runs. He's fucking fast. Wake me up when September ends. That's not the words. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, like my father's injury came to pass. I used to run, but now I've got a fat ass. Modern mate, I love you so. Alright, it's super flat this fucking tower, isn't it? Here comes the rain again, but it never seems to stop you. I can't believe you represented us. It's something I aspire to do. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> As my memory rests, but never forgets who you were. Steve, my man, I'm sorry for ruining this tribute. <laughs> it's gone, isn't it? It was just horrendous. The, the, the guitar is so fucking Was it so flat? It needs. Yeah, it needs. You gotta take those two guitars. Fuck, I know, man. It's horrendous, isn't it? Well, uh, Steve, if you're listening, mate, welcome to the show. Yeah. We uh, we love to have you. Do you think you could do an impersonation of Steve-O, Danny? Oh, fuck, nah, I couldn't. It'd be rough. Uh, yeah, it'd just be me talking, it'd basically. Be... Maybe a little slower. Yeah. It'd be, uh, well, boys, thanks for having me on the show, actually. Yeah. <laughs> He was a legend. He was an absolute legend. So, uh, <laughs> guys, at this time, we're going to go through our sponsors. And the first sponsor that I want to talk about is Audible. So, 
Audible team is essentially this uh, huge hub of, uh, of online uh, Audible, so audio books. And um, it's fascinating. Have you ever listened to Audible.com? Yeah, I'm listening to Natural Born Heroes and Audible right at the moment. Yep. Because I drive, every day I drive to uni, it takes me like an hour. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I get an hour of a book in. <laughs> Mate. Each way, I like smash books. Yeah, how fucking good are they? It's so much better to listen to books and read them. 100%. I mean, I can't even read. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I used to read. I've yeah. just become such a lazy prick. Yeah. I just can't. I just don't find the time. Well, mate, that's the thing. Like, it's it's a, it's it's just efficiency, isn't it? To actually kill two birds with one stone. So, like, transport, but it's active transport, and you, you're getting a book in. 100%. And you forget that you're driving. Yeah. Which is probably not a good it's thing. It's not the best thing. <laughs> it's well, not yeah. the best thing. You're like, oh, I'm at uni. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> I've I'm killed up. three people. <laughs> <laughs> I ran over my mate's dog. <laughs> Except yeah. I placed dog with son. <laughs> That's horrendous. That's fucked. Yeah. No, but I uh, and I read, read a study on it recently that um, like listening to a book is just as is just as good as reading a book. Like you still get the same amount of information in. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, I was listening to someone and they had the, a pretty good point. They're like. People have only been literate for like 300 years. Oh, yeah. And the rest of the time you heard stories and you listen to information by listening to it. Mm. Fuck, so, it's really actually point, actually. a much more natural way of absorbing information. Mm, mm. Um, yeah, no shit. Um, yeah, so guys, our offer today is... So, if that didn't convince you to jump on Audible, then I don't know what will because... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you're, uh, you're an idiot. So, you're an idiot. Just so uh, guys, head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash ADVF radio and you will receive, and the word is receive, not receive, receive uh, one free credit a month when you subscribe to their $15 a month um, subscription. It's fantastic. Is that the one you're on as well? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I, I may have done it without knowing it because yeah. I go on Audible and it's like, oh, you have six credits. I'm like, oh, uh, why? Yeah, yeah. I exactly. haven't paid for them. I must be on a subscription. A, uh, a poor subscription. Yes. <laughs> Braces. <laughs> yeah, essentially. Yeah. Braces. And uh, guys, this wouldn't be Adventure Fit Radio without uh, plugging Adventure Fit Travel. So we do have a ton of shit coming up for you guys, which is awesome. I believe, so our first Iceland trip um, has sold out, which is fantastic. We've capped that one. Uh, Our second Iceland trip is still, I believe there's still four places available for that one. So Mac and I will be leading that one um, in early December. So head to www.adventurefittravel.com to jump on there. We also have New Zealand coming up next year. We have Australia coming up, which would be fucking sick. I seriously hope I'm uh, leading that one. If not, I'll... uh, I'll probably boycott a bench fit radio, but uh, <laughs> uh, we also have Papua New Guinea and the Kokoda as well as Hawaii and some private trips as well. If you are a gym or a business owner and you want to take some employees or members on a private trip, um, email info at adventurefittravel.com. You can email myself at Tom at adventurefittravel.com or Bill, who is the founder, as we all know, doc at adventurefittravel.com. Uh, you can also receive 10% off all merch if you subscribe to our mailing list. So head to www.adventurefittravel.com, guys, and um, follow the prompts. All right, without further ado, here is Steve Monaghetti. Just to concentrate for a whole hour. And what I tell people now is you've got to zone in and zone out, and you just have to pick when you really want to zone in. Mm. And in a marathon, it's a bit like that because early on, you know, you've got a lot of energy and you just got to sort of bottle that up and save it. You don't want to be sprinting off and jumping up and having a good time, but you've got to be really efficient. So, and then as the the race unfolds, you then got to start to really tune in and go, okay, I really need to focus here because this is where I'm going to, you know, it's really starting to get hard. Mm. So mentally and physically you tune in, tune out, and then you, when you're on, you're on. And a bit like in life now, you've got to be, I reckon there's moments when you've got to be on. And then you've got to switch off a little bit because if you try and be on the whole day, you're just going to wear yourself out. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Can't yeah. Say, can't say so, I mean, well, I mean, that's a great sort of segue to get into the sort of mi- the, the mindset sort of stuff. I mean, is that something that you, I mean, you said you were always pretty good. You you kind of fell into this sport real. I mean, you worked hard for it, but you did fall into it initially. Yeah. What do you do with the mindset stuff? Like, is that something you practice or I just feel like it would be so tough to, you know, keep pushing for that amount of time. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's interesting because I never. You know, I, I talk to people or people would say that I was a, a really tough competitor to run against and yet I didn't I didn't see myself as being tough. I just, mm. you know, it was all, for me, it was all just replicating what I did in training. So whilst I never ran 42K in training, I, I did a lot of really hard training in preparation. So, 
you know, I say to people, I never really did anything in a race that I hadn't practiced in training in, in segments. So I don't think you're ever really putting yourself in a in an unusual situation. So I, I reckon, you know, it's a bit like when they give you the flu injection, you know, I think they, they used to give you a little bit of the flu. So yeah. little bits of exposure to the virus just build up your immunity. And that's kind of what I would do in training is, you know, it's 42K. So every Sunday I would run you know, 35k Sunday morning mm. and then another 10k that night. You can't do <laughs> it all in one day. <laughs> Not, yeah. Nothing ridiculous. No, that's right. And by doing case. that regularly, though, if yeah. you do that every Sunday, then it becomes a norm. Yeah. So when you then tell your body, right, oh, we're on the start line of the Olympic Games mm. and we've got to run 42k, well, your body goes, well, we do this every Sunday yeah. anyway. Yeah, we run exactly. 35. It's, yep. it's an extra, you know, but in time, it's actually less because, mm. you know, I was running for two and a half hours on a Sunday morning, whereas most of my marathons are about two hours 10. So... Mm. You know, I'm running less, so my body goes, oh, this is pretty normal. It's Sunday mm. morning, got to run a bit faster, but distance-wise, it's not so bad. And then the other part of my training would be, you know, I'd do some lead-up races where I'd run really fast or do training sessions during the week that were much quicker than race pace. So my body goes, oh, okay, in, in this race, we're going to have to run some parts where we run pretty fast, but mm. we run fast every week mm. in training. So it's almost normalising what's a very abnormal event. Mm. And so I tell people... Whilst everyone said I used to think I was a pretty tough competitor, I was just doing what my body expected to do week in, week out. Yes, and yeah. If you can normalise what's an, a very not normal thing like running a marathon, yeah. then it, it, you know, so I think just familiarise yourself with it, inoculate yourself for. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's exactly. I've never actually sort of put it in those terms before, but that's really effectively what you are training your body, and the body's a great adapter. And we can use technology, we can use sports science, we can do that. But at the end of the day, your personal body and your, your mind and your physical and mental approach is the most important thing. All of those other things are just supplementary mm-hmm. to what you've got, and mm. you've just got. And in marathon running, it's pretty simple. You know, I tell people you line up, it's, it's the human body. We, we don't. I don't even. I. I didn't used to race with a watch. I had no technology. Yeah. We didn't have any chips or anything Wasn't in our numbers. Shorts. No <laughs> yeah. shorts, just singlet, run. Listen to music either. Go. Yeah. No. No just music. Alone with your thoughts. Away we go. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's a pretty simple thing. So yeah. you know, people overcomplicate it. And all you, you do is just put one foot in front of another for fast for a very long time. Mm. You know, so mm. keep it pretty simple. I reckon. And so you had a coach as well. Uh, yeah. Through through your competitive. Yeah. So what were some of the different sort of training? Um, strategies and protocols you were doing like they do a lot of fart leg sort of stuff yep. um were you doing sprint work uh not per se i yeah. suppose i was doing eight 400s on a thursday night so i had a I had a very my training was as boring as batshit so every yep. week i would do exactly the same thing so i'd run normally between i mean i've built up and i wouldn't do it every week but i was running between 180 and 200 k's a week so twice a day every day mm. and on sunday long run Wednesday, longish run, and then Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays, I'd do some faster sessions. And that was, I mean, uh, there's a session that's become yep. known as Mono Fartlek. So, my yep. Fartlek session that my coach and I sort of bumbled over the phone when he started coaching me. I've only ever had two coaches, and both of them were Olympians. One was my year nine English teacher in Ballarat, okay, coincidentally. Right. Yeah, Tony bit of a Benson. Shout out. What's his name? Yeah, Tony Benson. There he is. He's He'll still be around. <laughs> yeah. He's a, a loves adventure radio, actually, old mate, Tony. Yeah, he does. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and then Chris Wardlaw, so I, and, and both of those, and they were slightly different. Tony was a lot more speed oriented. So when I was, he coached me from sort of 16 to about 20, 21, and we did a lot of quicker stuff in Ballarat with a, I had a few mates, and we'd run some fast, really tough training down the track. Mm. And then when Chris took over, it was more uh, longer, consistent endurance based training because he's more of a marathon runner well he was a marathon runner himself and and himself in a marathon coach so but i would still on a thursday night go down the track and do what's almost rob de costello's session the eight 400s with the 200 float we would say because we weren't jogging we were running 64 second 400s and 39 40 second 200 recoveries so we're still still pretty pretty along pretty well Mm. yeah yeah yeah, absolutely and that's what we do so we do just the the Volume of training over the week would make you tired, mm. and then we do these little little spurts of really quick stuff just to keep my my fast twitch fibers up and about. Mm. Yeah, Steve, mm. do you think um, distance running has changed since you know since you were racing? Like, I, I notice there's a lot more people running a lot more ultra marathons these days, yep. for instance, and there's lots of trail, trail running. Yep. Um, yeah. What do you What do you think about 
about that. And yeah, it's interesting because the marathon used to be the sort of the Everest. Yeah, and you know now you run a marathon. People are running like now people just marathons just like going down doing a local fun run. Yeah, so you know yeah, I running go, like 180 k. Yeah, and it's ridiculous. Stuff. You know, in a marathon every day. I think was there. It's, there's some guys with you know I've just come back from from Berlin um, and there's I think there's some guy I met over there who's he's done seven marathons in. On seven continents in seven days. So I still I can't even logistically work out. It. It's not the marathon running that'd yeah. be hard if you just get into the seven yeah. continents. I would have thought. Well, so, depending on where he's travelling to, he's probably going back in time. He was and just doing it. Yeah. <laughs> so it was amazing. Yeah. He's incredible. a time travelling marathon runner. <laughs> so <laughs> stuff like that, and you know, you look at that, and people kind of get amazed by that. Whereas when I was growing up, I remember I used to say, "Oh, I'm a marathon runner," and people would look at you like you've got two heads. You know, you're crazy. Yeah. Why would you do that? Whereas it's it's become sort of just normalised now and you've got to do all this other stuff to mm. got to do a few of them you know got to do one a day for every you know, for the yeah. year and stuff like that to, and what, to what would you put that down to has like um, have just like people's expectations risen or have, have pe- the way people train differently that's allowed them to do that um, people I, doing I, things differently these days yeah I think um, I reckon it's that we've probably had a recreational running boom and, and I I don't even think we call it a boom now because I think it's just it's normal life now. So lots of people are finding that running is a great exercise to do because it's, you know, it's pretty reasonably priced. It's really social. Um, the Australian environment lends itself to it. So, you know, running for charity. So there's a lot of really good causes now. People are using running as a vehicle to raise awareness of different um, causes. So I think it's sort of bundled up in a combination of things and that's, meant that people are introduced to the formal aspect of running now i reckon it's it's another transition i think you it's a bit like going to you know you do you go to school and you do your formal education and then you actually go oh i've got a choice now mm. i might continue to do education and i reckon we've probably matured enough that rather than being in that formal environment people saying oh yeah look i know what formal running is i've been down done the local fun run mm. and been in you know run for the kids and melbourne marathon now i want it what's the next you know, I want to control, mm-hmm. be a bit more in control of what I'm doing. And I think ultra running and trail running allows them. It's less time, you know, not, you're not all, you don't have to turn up and, and put your number on. You can, yes. you still can, but you, you kind just, of, you got, you're in control a little bit more. So I reckon yeah. it's probably another level of your personal involvement in exercise. Mm. Yeah. But, but in terms of like the actual distance run, like what, what, what What's changed in terms of people just running way longer? I mean, like, would that have seemed, like, unfathomable back in the day that people, someone would run 180 k's, or lots yeah. of people would be doing it? That's right. So, and I think that's where even training, when I started running marathons, 200 k a week was a lot. Now it's, you know, there's a lot of Africans who are, you know, they're running obviously faster than we were down lower levels in the two hours and they're doing, you know, 250 or 260K. So I think um, we've probably seen in the 40s and 50s, Emil Zadipek ran in army boots and did some crazy sessions, but he wasn't running that much long distance running. And then Deke sort of through and Frank Shorter through the 70s kind of pushed out the mileage a bit. And now for someone to tell me that they're running 250k a week is mm. not almost unfathomable mm. so people see that as being normal so i think it's achievable now so it's a bit more of human evolution where they go oh well just to run 100k that's not such a big deal anymore mm. so as we've an equipment's changed you know lifestyle yes we've got sports science that can modify you know so you can probably allow you to do a lot more so if you if I had said to you in in the eighties, right, I go out and run two hundred k this week, you'd, you'd, you wouldn't be able to do it. Whereas now you've got the shoes, the technology, the trails, you won't get lost, you mm-hmm. know, and the nutrition. So it's almost now I look at you and go, well, that's not so silly. I reckon you could do that with a bit of um, preparation. So I think it's become a lot easier for people to just accept that that's what they can do and and do it comfortably. Mm-hmm. And and they see that as a challenge that the formal marathon used to be the the ultimate challenge whereas now that you know you, you can it's almost open-ended the challenge yes there's yeah. no limit now yeah so that's, that's, that's definitely a, a thing, thing like i mean with that and that translates into all aspects of of sport as well i mean oh, i was watching like a youtube video um and it had just this really cool timeline showing the the fastest 100 meter sprints from like you know 200 years ago to, to now and you just see this huge improvement you know and people i mean 20 30 years ago were saying oh no one will ever break 97 or you know 50 years ago people were saying no one will ever break 10 seconds yeah but now people are saying that about nine five and, and things like that and 
I guess the, the scope has kind of changed now to this understanding that maybe there is no real ceiling. No, as, as interestingly, technology. though, Tommy, mm. I, the times aren't really improving. I mean, mm. Australian marathon running, women women are going pretty well, but the yeah. men have just sort of bottomed out a little All bit. Right. So I think it's interesting, and I kind of always think that the more people that do it, normally that would push more to yeah. the top end. So yeah. you'd see an improvement at the top end, but it's actually... Um, you know, marathon times, certainly men's marathon really? times are just sort of levelled out a little bit. So whether whether we've kind of at the top end, you know, we're less focused on the quicker being um, the best in the world mm. and we're more, it's more exposure to just doing. Mm. So, you know, you get a pat on, don't want to put this the wrong way, yep. you know, Katsy, you get a pat on the back for, for running seven marathons in seven days. Oh, yeah. And I go... No, no, mate. Why don't you just run one fast? Try to get a good yeah. yeah. Try and run as fast as you possibly yeah. can, because because ultimately that's what the list for me is. You know, it's, it's who, I don't care. All I wanted to do was run the fastest marathon I could possibly run. Now, if I'm at the Olympic Games representing Australia, it's less about time; it's mm. more about a result. But I also want to run the best I possibly can, and especially when you're wearing an Australian singlet, because you know that's when you you grow an extra leg when you've got the national colours on. So mm. for me, it's all about running as fast as I possibly could. So I'm trying to get people's mindsets back to um, be less about doing um, repetition and, and do it fast, you know. And that's what all of my training was done. That's why we did that quicker stuff. If I wanted mm. to run. Mm. If I just wanted to complete a marathon, all I would do was every few days I'd run 42K at a slow pace. Yes. But yeah. I actually wanted to run a marathon as fast as I possibly could. So the extra dimension for me was putting that fast at running in there and doing some track races, running some half marathons as mm. a lead up in some race in race situations. So I like to challenge people. So, and, you know, again, relating it to business or to life, you know, or whatever pursuit you're doing, you know, don't do it for, for um, just to turn up and do it over, you know, hey, I've got this job for the next 10 years, so I'm just, I might as well just turn up today. I don't want to wear myself out today because mm. I want to be still here in 10 years' time. No, go hard today and yes. challenge yourself a bit. And you've got a limited window out. as an athlete as well. You, know? you have. That's right. Yeah. So you've got to make, yeah. Make, what, make, what is make that window just challenge? going off that with, with marathon running? Uh, probably about uh, five or six years, I reckon. Oh, right, yeah. okay. So it's yep. probably – uh, Deke and I um, – probably had slightly longer careers and and Ali Chip, Kipchoge who holds a world record and Olympic champion mm. does he hold the world record got to think now whether I'm not sure maybe he doesn't but he's he's ran two three um and he he won he won the world championships I think in 2007 so he's been yeah. around for 10 years so that's that's a long career especially for an African who they tend to um, train pretty hard. Yeah. And the intensity mm-hmm. of their training means they don't have really long careers. But he's come from the track, and so he's probably extended his career by getting out onto the road. So, mm. so ten years is a long time in marathon running because just the cumulative load of of running that two hundred k's every week it just pounds your body. Oh, and, yeah. And so well, you wear it. So it's the physical limit of how much training your body can absorb yes. and you normally you know you start marathon running sort of in your mid-20s and you probably peak okay. at about 28 mm-hmm. and you you probably get through to about 33 34 and that's probably about it what do you think about sort of like variability of terrain having an impact on a person's uh, health for instance like i know if i'm just right if i'm running in a straight line on a flat surface it kills my body. Yeah. Mm. Just the repetitive movements, doing the same thing all the time and on the same surface kills me. Whereas I like, if I go up to the Yu Yangs and go yep. for a run through the trail, I love it. Mm. I love it. The variability of the surface, jumping over things, different surfaces. Weight of the athlete. Yeah. And that's really good. And I, I encourage people. I love my, you know, going out in the forest and just rolling over some hills mm. you know, around Ballarat. We've got some great forests. You know, you're off. You're off the bitumen mm. or concrete, which just smashes your legs. Yeah. And you do get you're using different muscle groups because you know you're not only running up and down. You're actually running laterally. Like you yeah. know, you got to roll your ankles, so you have got to get a bit of ankle stability and the variety of just. I, I hate str- seeing. I hate looking down the. Ro- I hate running on the beach, for example, because just, it just it goes never forever. gets any closer. Yeah. And you know, it's straight. It's flat, and sometimes it's windy, and you you know you're hooting along, and then you get 
to your turnaround point and your turnaround come back and yeah. you're going to head win for you think, you know, no wonder I was feeling so good yeah. I've got a head wind <laughs> all right, the way yeah. back and you look up in those buildings or that part whilst it's beautiful to run on the beach it just seems to take so long because it's flat and um, and you know you don't get that visual eye line of anything approaching so mm. I love that variety in the bush and I think it's a lot better physically for you mm. mentally you're getting a bit of oxygen you know nothing better than you know, I've had a hard day at work mm. and you head out into the bush by yourself, mm. maybe with some tunes on or just like, a, what do I say? What's what's the best song in the in the forest? Yeah. Sounds of silence. Yeah, yeah. absolutely it is. Yeah. And, and I reckon, and I'm telling this to people now, the first time you run in the forest, you actually don't hear anything and it's a bit boring. You think, oh, geez, I should have brought my yep. um, headphones. And then the next time you go, you kind of go, oh, geez, I, I didn't realise that bird noise mm. suddenly after you go f- sort of five or six times you suddenly you're hearing every crackle mm, you're hearing yes. the lizards you're, you're much more aware of your up. environment and your yeah. surroundings it's you like are. it's it's mindful you know and you become a bit more attuned and yeah mm. and it's when it, it's kind of i don't want to get philosophical but it's a bit like when they say talk about mindfulness mm. mindfulness is a bit of a journey because mm-hmm. you have to you have to kind of get rid of all the hustle and bustle before you, you get in the right headspace. And yep. that's exactly like running out in the forest. I say to people, you need to probably be out there for an hour because I reckon it takes you 20 minutes to get rid of all the shit from yep. normal life. And then you've got 20 minutes of where it's paradise. And then you've probably got 20 minutes where you're sort of re-entering society again. Well, isn't that a classic example of what you both said, just just mindfulness meditation, where, I mean, it's a thing, it's, an, it's a very active way to, to practice meditation. But I mean, mm-hmm. realistically, and especially in today's world with, with constantly being connected and, and society always having an impact and, and, you know, and all these things we're always taking in, it is quite hard to get rid of all that sort of stuff. Um, it's funny you yeah. said 2020, that is actually how long it takes me to, to, to find that zone of meditation. So I thought I'll it was good. How, that's how long it takes you to run 5k. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I'm, yeah, look, I mean, look at me. <laughs> no, um, no, I think that's really important yeah. that, and I reckon also with social media, I think we're very reactive now. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we're all sitting on our phones. Someone sends you, like, you know, we're having a conversation now. And if someone's phone beeps, yeah. it's really hard yeah. to not focus on that phone. Because yeah. for some reason, we, we feel like we've got to react to that. Mm. Whereas if you're out in the forest, I don't even care. You don't have to be running. You can just be walking. Mm. You can just be standing out in the forest. For- I actually like, I like the mundane movement. So... Running's quite repetitive and boring. Walking, you know, if you're standing, you're probably not quite getting that. Co- you need to almost get that boring rhythm because that actually then allows you to, to relax. So yes. I think you need that rhythm first. But you're actually in control of your environment. Mm-hmm. So I'm out yeah. in the forest. I've got no phone and no one's telling me where to go. So I often, I do the left-right game, you yeah, know. Yeah. So I'm just out in the forest. I just go left at the first turn, right at the next. I don't actually know where I'm going. Yeah. But I'm kind of in control, but no one's telling me where mm. to go, so I'm not reactive. Mm. I'm just letting it un- unfold, but mm. I'm kind of, in, in an odd way, I'm still in control of what's happening. Well, that makes sense because yeah. breathing is just a rhythm. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And running is another rhythm. It, yeah. It's something that you have control over so you can focus your attention on that mm. rather than all your thoughts. Yeah. So that is a perfect way to meditate, I would have thought. Yeah. yeah. And I'm often, even now, I will run with a group of people. And the two things I listen for, the foot strike and their breathing yeah because the foot strike to me is the physical if you you know if you hit slap in the ground you know you're getting tired you know it's not very efficient and if you're breathing heavy you're obviously then aerobically you're probably running too fast for your capabilities at this point in time so Mm. there are a couple of warning signs for me so there you go they're the they're the two things so Mm. you're out in the forest you know if you got your your music on you can't hear your foot strike or and your breathing sort of a bit more probably resonates a bit more but mm. you know i reckon you've got to be in tune with those things so Absolutely. that gives you a and you know a way of picking up on those and half the people it's interesting i'll say you know gee you're breathing heavy and someone will go to me oh, am i really or they'll yeah. kind of go <laughs> yeah am i am i exactly. am i, really? <laughs> am I really? I'm thinking, yeah. well i think you just answered your own question yeah. Mate, so it's TV, interesting it? <laughs> yeah that's right it shouldn't be um so it shouldn't oh. be that hard. So those signs for me are the things I pick up, and sometimes people will pick them up on me. Yeah. You know? So mm. I think they're pretty simple things. But because we've got so much um, background noise now, we're often not in tune to those really simple things in life. And that's a re- yeah. I mean, I mean, everything you just said there is just. I mean, it, it makes so much sense of why you've obviously reached the level that you have. Because being in tune with all those things is a great way to monitor how you're going. Like if you 
So, I mean, being focused and being aware is is not just important from like a, a general sense of being relaxed in the world. But I mean, if you're competing in something and you're not aware of your breathing, I mean, breathing, as we all know, has a very, very high influence on, on the amount of oxygen you get to your muscles. So how fast you're taking your legs over and stuff. And for someone to not, I would almost go as far as to say, but for someone to not practice some form of mindfulness meditation and then go out and run a marathon, they're just at a at a huge disadvantage just to someone that knows what their breathing's like, know what their mental edge is like. And um, is that something that you and your coach actively practiced? Um, not really. I think just the amount of running, you know, 90% or 85%, 90% of my running was just time on legs, mm. either within the forest, with groups of people. So it was quite it was quite a relaxing mm. environment anyway. Yes, so yes. I think you kind of... You, you just subconsciously develop it anyway. So, yeah. and that's the one thing that I'm also telling people is, you know, running allows you to to get an awareness of yourself. So, why wouldn't you take that when you're out in the yeah. forest? You know, listening to your breathing, mm. or your foot strike, it allows you to kind of be monitoring what's happening a bit more. And I think again in society, it sounds like I'm I'm doing a <laughs> no, that's a right. yeah, today, but, uh, uh, society. Yeah. <laughs> but we're really reactive now. You know, like we go. Oh, oh, the classic is, you know, you go to the doctor and you sit in front of the doctor and you go, "Well, doc, what's wrong with me?" Mm. And well, the doc goes, "Well, give me some, give me a bit of help here." Yeah. Right? You know, well, you're the doctor. You tell me. You know, yeah. or we go to the physio, or we go to the, you know, the personal coach, and you know, so we're getting a lot of. Well, you make me fit. You at the end of the day, we have to be in control of that so i find that quite unusual that they are resources that that and we're going to them because we want you know we want to we want to develop or we want to improve in a particular area well we've got to take ownership of that so if you don't doesn't matter how many times you go to the gym you know you pay a gym membership you, that doesn't make you strong no, you actually no. got to go you yes, got to do something so you got to take ownership of that so I, i'm trying to get people to understand that running actually allows you to know your body pretty well so i remember by the end of my career i had a physio who you know he's, he's a good friend of mine um who i still catch up with now and i was ringing him from overseas he, he got to the stage he, he didn't really want to travel with me and um so i would ring him and, and i had so many uh, symptoms so i'd say you know i've got this 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 and he'd go oh that's what you got so he didn't even need to he could we could diagnose it on the phone he didn't need to see me physically because mm. i was providing him with so much information that it was you know narrowed down what the injury was and mm. then we just went straight so the first thing's diagnosis so i gave him great information we could diagnose it you cannot fix what you don't know yes so first thing's diagnosis once he diagnosed and then okay pete well i agree with you that's what we've got now what do i do so it's almost like I wanted to get that bit out of the way yep. because that's the that's the bit we know. Yes. You know, so I go, right, well, we lock that in. Yeah, great. Now, okay, now the bit I'm, I'm, I'm wanting your advice on is what do I do now? Yep. And I think in, in life, you know, at the moment, people all, they all, they, they're getting fixated by the diagnosis. Yep. Forget about the diagnosis. Get on to, okay, once you get that, now what am I going to do to, yeah, the to treatment improve? Plan, yeah. Yeah, 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 treatment. So, you know, and that's where you're, you're improving in life. Mm. If, if you get too caught up in, in just, you know, finding out what's wrong or where you are in life then mm. you're not giving yourself a chance to actually challenge I think you're also going to take a bit of ownership and you know I always say to people you're your own best coach mm. I mean if you're if you're injured or like you're hurting yourself when you're doing a particular activity well you take some initiative and mm. work it out yourself how can I fix this don't mm. don't try to um, outsource it to someone else and make it their problem mm. one of, a, a question I wanted to ask you is you, you mentioned shoes before yeah. and footwear. How important do you think that is, especially recently since, uh, say, barefoot shoes have become a big thing? And yep. I, I've also often, like, because I, I work at a gym as well, if I'm teaching someone how to run, yep. I'll say, take your shoes off yep. and now go, go for a run barefoot and notice how you're running differently. You can't land hard on your heels. You can't flop about because it's going to hurt yourself. Do you think if... if uh, is barefoot running a good thing? Is it a good training tool? Should people be doing it more often? Mm. It's a great training tool, no doubt. I think we've probably got a bit carried away on, you know, people thinking it was the be all and end all. It is mm. one component of your running and, and great, you know, and I I still, you know, I still will wear my Nike Freeze out for a couple of runs just so I can feel the ground and get my intrinsics working, my toes. You know, I've got a I've got a calf problem at the moment and I'm looking at what particular foot strike and footwear I will use just to 
allow me to there's something that's not quite right in my running it's probably overuse probably but i'm getting some calf issues so i'm i'm again i'm i'm using that self-diagnosis mm. for, okay there's information out there but what applies to me there's not too many people you know i can't go to the i can't go to dr google and go okay 55 year old bloke been running since he was 15 so 40 years of running probably done 250,000 k's got a sore calf mm. what do you reckon dr google goes jeepers <laughs> yeah right have a rest yeah. you know give mm. the body yeah dr. cut your leg off always says that for me yeah. Yeah. Like, are you kidding <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah i remember i remember i, I i'm not going to go into details of what i had yeah. but, yeah. but i was it was very late it was very late at night and i was looking up the symptoms and oh, i had cancer shit. yeah i had cancer yeah. Yeah. Like I said. Right. well i think <laughs> you started cancer. cancer don't you and work back it's yeah. just a matter of which degree you cancer you cancer so, <laughs> so I think you know, in my circumstance, you know, you got it. You are your own best doctor, and you know, I'm I'm trying to just um, work on the resources that mm. I've got to adapt. And barefoot running will be a component of that. And I think I probably got a bit too far away. You know, I wear some um, orthotics and, and a heel raise in my shoe, and I'm probably looking to just maybe transition back to try and make it a bit more natural. So I mm. will try and do a bit more of. Um, not particularly barefoot running, but try and get a bit more activation mm. of my um, toes and feet. And let's be honest, your feet are the only thing that strike the gr- – it's inter- they are the contact point when you exactly. run. I, I actually didn't think of this till, till a few years ago. Yeah. For my for 30 years, I was just running, but they are the only things that contact the ground exactly. is your feet. And they, so and they know important. exactly what sort of surface you're running on, and if they have no sensation, mm. how do you know – if you're running well or not. You know, that's right. And even the thing, I, I remember, you know, when, when you run and we don't ever hit a curb. Mm. So how good is your brain and, and the message is going to your feet that you miss a curb by about a millimetre mm. and on a, you know, on a two hour run, I'm yeah. probably going up and down 500 curbs. So how good yeah, is your body right. to be able to it's just send it? that message to, to adapt to that? So you think of just very minor things, that repetition of mm. running is a really significant thing. So if you've mm. got a, a slight ankle displacement, if you're hitting the ground, you know, a thousand times in a in a in a two hour run or mm. more than that, then that's a really that can really be exaggerated exactly. and be, can, can become a problem. Yeah, but so you if you if you had early. more sensation through your feet, your foot might be able to adapt and change adjust to that. Adjust. And, and why should essence. you get an orthotic to do it when hopefully you can you can do it well, yourself? Well, the, yeah, the, yeah. Exact, the thing is, like humans have been money, running for millions of years. Mm. I mean, we're perfectly adapted for running, and we ran barefoot presumably, or with mm. at least minimalist shoe. And so, if, if our foot has adapted to run, so why take away our natural? Mm. Why fix it? Yeah. yeah. Why fix it? What doesn't need to be fixed? I, think yeah. I love it. He's, he's answered his own question. Yeah. He's a good man. Isn't he's he? a good I mean, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice, nice to be here just to help you out to solve all your <laughs> yeah. problems. Yeah. Yeah. We're a team. Yeah. Hey, um, Steve, we know we've got to get you out of here at some point because you've got to catch the uh, the tramps for everyone. That's right. Home. I should but be running, shouldn't yeah, I? Yeah, should yeah. Run. I'll, I'll be run. running to Take get the tramps. Take your shoes off. It'll look weird, but that's all right. We normally finish off the show with six questions. But I think what I'd like to ask you to, uh, more about, actually, mm. is what it was like competing on the world stage for the Olympics. Cause do you want to... So, just... Tommy, you know I can't count to six. So, you yeah. obviously got rid of the six questions. I'm a very simple man. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah, that was a little bit of background study for me. But, uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to know um, what it was like competing. So, why don't you give the, uh, the listeners a brief idea of how many times you went... Um, what you competed in, and then obviously what it was like to, to compete there. Sure. So, you know, I made that first team at Commonwealth Games in, in 86, and mm. then I actually represented Australia um, continually for 15 years then. So I went to four Olympics, four Commonwealth Games, and six World Championships and one World Cup. So mm. at the time, we didn't have World Championships every two years like we did at the end of my career so I went to a World Cup and ran the 10k in Barcelona mm. for Oceania not actually for Australia for mm. the Oceania team in 89 so so to have such a consistent career and that's probably what it's I'll be remembered for the longevity of my career you know running marathons can be a, a price to pay in your body but yeah um, and you know I won won a bronze medal at the Worlds in 97 Commonwealth, I've got the full set of Commonwealth medals in the marathon. So started with the bronze, went to a silver in Auckland in 1990 and then won the gold in 94. Went back to the, I 
you know, got the full set of marathon medals. So I went to Kuala Lumpur at the Commonwealth Games in 98 mm. and won a bronze medal in the 10K on the track, which was a nice, you know, I wasn't probably noted as a track runner. So to win a bronze medal in the 10K was a, mm. was a good outcome. And uh, one ran some world record, or world best as they were for half marathon and ran down to, you talk about the two hour marathon, I yeah. ran 60.06 for a half marathon. So, you know, <laughs> I, I ran at the pace basically that they were running. To, yes. I've actually run it. Well, the world record's about 58.20 now. And my, my three were slightly downhill, so they're not recognised, but I, was, I still run them pretty well. Yeah, I still have. You know, mm. ran about 60.30 probably for the three of them. So, um, you know, I've, I've run at a pace that's at just under 2 hour one, 201 for marathon. So for me, that's probably – my best distance was probably the half marathon, mm. you know. So I think when I ran 2.8 so I've got the second fastest Australian time for the marathon when I won the Berlin Marathon in 1990. And that, <sighs> at the time, it was the 13th fastest – marathon of all time and the fastest mm. in the year for the year in 1990 now they'd, they'd be running 13 faster times a week yeah, so, yeah let yeah. alone for the yeah. year so they've progressed a little bit but you know at the time i was probably one of the best i i, I considered myself one of the best distance runners in the world i mm. think and deke was is probably australia's best male marathon runner and lisa on probably the women's she she won a silver medal and i kind of think i'm probably in more of a distance running, and I, I I ran really well. I ran fourth at the World Cross Country, so my cross country half marathon, some marathons. So probably across the board, I'm probably um, got a better career than Deke. And then Karen McCann's probably or Benita Willis. They're probably whilst Lisa's the best female marathon runner, they're probably Australia's best distance runners. Yeah, so yeah, I sort yeah. of categorise it a bit differently through that. And for me, a lot I ran 22 marathons in my career, 12 of them were for my country for zero dollars yes. so the other 10 i had some good paydays in the other 10 but over half my career was wearing the australian singlet for zero but yeah. it's not about dollars no, when you put a lot not. on the yeah. australian singlet yeah it's, it's you know it's all about you do the best you can for your country and absolutely and i will never forget you know when i won that commonwealth games gold medal in 94 i was on the dais they raised an australian flag and they played the national anthem for my performance yes that, that personally is a very satisfying thing Absolutely. to watch that flag the physical representation of the flag yes and then hearing your national anthem because of your personal efforts that's that's a bloody amazing Phenomenal. thing to happen yeah and even now when i hear the national anthem you know it, it frustrates me a little bit when you know people will be talking when we're playing the national anthem or they're kind of going oh great you know get this formality out of the way so yeah. we can get the game going i think no 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 this is this is about our country yeah, here. And yeah. If, we, if we didn't have this country we wouldn't be playing this. We wouldn't have the mm. freedom to be able to just go and watch a footy or play in, in the sports and activities that we do. So mm. so I really respect that. And, you know, it's nice to think that, you know, some kid from downtown Ballarat, you know, worked really hard, had some potential as a distance runner, worked really hard and was able to um, get to, you know, to pretty high levels. And mm. for me, that says, well, anybody, if you've got potential and you believe in yourself and you work really hard, who knows where that mm. can lead you. Mm. Well, Steve-O, um, just want to ask you one more little rapid-fire question because mm-hmm. um, I think we've got six minutes till the tramp, so yep. we're moving well. <laughs> um, this will be quite quick. But uh, what, are you, what are you currently working on? What's, uh, what's the Steve Moni, Monigetti of today? Uh, probably a lot of I'm the chef de mission for Commonwealth Games team for um, on the Gold Coast next mm. year. So that's taking um, a bit of my time. That's fantastic. And mm. the planning that goes into hopefully allowing the focus to be on the athletes at mm. Gold Coast. So I don't, it's not about me or the team. You know, It's all about the athletes having... A good result and a good experience mm. and you know so that takes up a bit of my time and i'm also on the sports commission so i'm hopefully putting something back and in, mm. you know improving the environment in australian sport and well, i'm ambassador for everything you know i'm doing october at the moment for life education got Beautiful. melbourne marathon next week you know i've got run for the kids as i'm race director for that we raise money for the good friday appeal so i have a great variety you know i do lots of different things and get to meet lots of groups of people and life's life's pretty good and it's nice to you know i come along and you guys say your mum and dad remember who i was so you know i know when i'm getting old yeah my time's moved on (laughs) but still to be relevant you know and i've I've been able to probably transition out of being you know a marathon runner probably into a bit more of a you know a uh, management admin mm, and mm. Um, public figure which has been nice to continue to do what i'm doing my running physically i'm starting to struggle to do the running that I'm well, doing. Well, you've got cancer weather. That's right, exactly. That's one of the best things. <laughs> <No. laughs> <Well, laughs> uh, that's true, yeah. yeah. But I love love the chat, yeah, yeah, yeah. really. And that's the thing, you know, I've probably become a bit more 
philosophical over the time. I'm, mm. I'm a simple man, but I love the, the, you know, the conversations that we have. But, and that's the vehicle of running's allowed me to have so many conversations. And hopefully, you know, some of the people who are listening to this can say, hey, that resonates with what I'm thinking. And totally. we either agree or disagree. We have a conversation at the end of the day. Mm. You know, it's been, a bit, been beneficial to me and hopefully beneficial to the listeners. Well, Steve, where uh, where can people find you, mate? Anything you want to plug? Oh um, no, I'm easy to find. There's no secrets with me. I'm a very open and yeah, you know, yeah. I love you know. I don't think my mum keeps saying, "Oh, where are you going to?" I'm saying, oh, "I'm talking to this group." She says, "You must just talk to every person in Australia. There can be no one left that, that <laughs> wants to hear your story." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm out there, and I've got. Um, just Steve Monaghetti you'll find me as I say I'm ambassador for everything and Beautiful. easy to find and very accessible love my love life so yeah it's good to good to be still out there and promoting mm. sport and life and active and healthy and good well-being I hope Beautiful, Steve. Well, uh, it's uh, ten thirty-seven, mate. So uh, take the shoes Ron. off and start running to the tram. It was a Fantastic. pleasure to have you on board, mate. Great, thanks, Tommy. Thank you. Beautiful. Cheers, Thanks, boys. thanks Cheers, mate. Good man. Cheers. Excellent. And uh, that is a wrap. Alrighty, guys, we hope you enjoyed that show. We apologise for the initial fuck-up. Uh, <laughs> if you want the honest truth, that was completely my fault. I was uh, I was thinking about something else. <laughs> no, I, just, I, I don't even know. I just didn't press just the forgot recording. forgot to press record. I forgot to get a recording. The one yeah. job you had. Yeah, the one job. Literally pressing record. <laughs> so pretty horrendous stuff. But uh, uh, if you liked any or any of the stuff at all that we mentioned in that show, then please uh, jump on iTunes and give us a rating and review. Rating and reviews allow us to jump up the uh, the ratings on iTunes and we get more exposure there. So if you like the show, uh, jump on over there and help us help you. Help us help you. Um, As well, team, you can uh, subscribe to the show. So head to podcast, the podcast app, or you can jump onto Stitcher for all you Android fuckwits. Nah, you're probably lovely. Um, guys, Audible Trial, we are sponsored by Audible, so head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash ADVF radio. I believe it's ADVF. Try ADVF radio. If that doesn't work, head to ADVF and you will receive one free credit. Also sponsored by Adventure for Travel, guys. Ton of good shit coming up on Adventure for Travel, so head over there. And Cassie, do you have anything to plug? Absolutely fuck all. Fuck like, all. I don't make anything or do anything. Yeah. So. I just sit at home. I just sit at home. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, uh, head to sit at home and uh, yeah, catch you over there. Watch me sit in my ass. Yeah, it's a good ass. All right, guys, until next week. <laughs> bye bye for now. Discovery Roger, go for deploy.